OK, everybody can hear me? Cool. Hi, my name is Gary Shurset. I work for uh, Apogee, and I've been working for Apogee since 2014. Um, I'm a tech strategist based here in Stockholm, uh, helping our customers with their API initiatives, sometimes hands-on work, actually, uh, building things, and sometimes uh, just more strategic with the business, like what, what types of things to focus on, uh, how to be successful with your API programs and initiatives, and kind of what things not to do. And today, I'm going to be talking to you guys about microservices and service mesh. And, and by the way, I want to say I, I agree with Amit, actually, that uh, a lot of times this does become a mess. Um, and I have a whole lot of opinions, which I'm happy to, <laughs> to share with you at, back at our booth on the, the do's and don'ts of, of Kubernetes and kind of containerization in general. OK, I have a couple of goals uh, with this talk. So I'm going to talk um, a little bit about uh, uh, the service mesh and the value of a service mesh, kind of API management, and where these kind of combine and meet each other and intersect. And there's a continuum of, of worlds there that we're going to try to address. So when we talk about microservices, um, oftentimes, uh, of late at least, we're talking about kind of sharding up an existing monolith into a bunch of smaller little pieces. And that can take different forms. So uh, in, in this case, as we're showing here, we've got this big monolith. We start to break it up into these microservices. And then maybe over time, we create some sort of cont container manager and put, that, uh, put those microservices inside that service mesh. But as a point of reference, I want uh, just to, to point out that this is very common. And in fact, it's very often that we refer to microservices as if they're synonymous with containers running inside some sort of orchestrated container environment. Uh, but that's not true. If you want to go write uh, your own small framework for running PHP-based and LAMP-based um, um, microservices, you can absolutely do that. This is just one way to do it. And it happens to be a way that speaks to the kind of Google at scale method of handling it at the moment. But there's another way to do this, right? So if we want to move towards microservices, instead of breaking up this big monolith into a bunch of smaller pieces, we might instead just wrap that monolith with an API so that we can lie to our consuming audience, uh, you know, the, the, the real customers of our APIs, which are developers, so that they think we're a modern uh, company that has a bunch of microservices that lie underneath it. Um, and, and this is important because actually that might be an evolutionary way for you to make these steps, right? You start by wrapping this ugly monolith with, you, know, you put the, the, the makeup on a pig. Um, and uh, the, what the customers uh, of your APIs don't know is that actually underneath the, you know, the surface, you're doing all this extra work to kind of make that happen. Um, and and the, the, what, what drives all this together are these APIs. So I've got consuming audiences that are communicating with these APIs. And those APIs should, in my humble opinion, form a sort of contract. So as I said, the real customers of your APIs are, are the developers. And those developers are going to agree to a contract that you, as the producer of these APIs, are providing. And um, everybody needs to honor this contract. It doesn't work. But these contracts can grow and grow, and they can have multiple versions, and that can be confusing. And so we kind of might need some way to keep track of that. And that's where service mesh might come into the picture if you're running uh, type, that type of mesh with a microservice architecture that's probably based on something like containerization. Strictly speaking, mesh doesn't have to be containerized, but that's usually how it's done. And in that case, we're we're looking to, to connect and kind of control that flow of traffic. We want to secure it so that we've got a, a one pane of glass or a single pane of glass looking at how all these services are, are secured. Control so that we can apply different policies in a uniform way and in a very specific kind of way. And then finally, observe, right? So we want to pull traffic out of this mesh of services so that um, we can make some kind of determination of what it might mean for posterity. So um, let's talk a bit uh, about management for shared APIs. So in this picture here, um, I've got a bunch of clients here on the left that are consuming these APIs. Uh, in, in my case, since I work for Apigee, and the Apigee API platform is sitting in the, in the middle. And then a couple of, of applications there on the far right. So uh, a legacy application and some sort of model with application. One's using SOAP and one's using REST. So this is a kind of a common, common way to think of the world. Um, and it, why do we care about API management in this case? Well, because we want to be able to discover these services. So I got SOAP and I got REST, and that's not uniform for my developer audience. And again, your developers are your customers. And so I want my customers to have a good experience. And so I don't want them to have to use SOAP for this service and REST for this service and, uh, and some funky custom XML thing for this other service. Uh, uh, rather, I want to make that kind of modern and easy to use an approach for them. Uh, and then I want to get reporting information on it. And theoretically, if I really succeed, succeed with this, the holy grail is to monetize it so I can make some real money off it. 
OK, so this grows, right? So I still got these clients here on the left, and I've got, got my services there on the right, but now I've got clients that are internal as well. So I've got an internal application that likewise is, is consuming these applications. And the drawing here, they're connecting directly, but we can imagine they might be going through Apigee as well, kind of as a logical connector there. So likewise, an internal app is also a developer, or developed by a developer who is a customer of these APIs and has some opinions about how they should work. And this grows, and that internal app starts calling other services, or those services likewise are going to that internal application, and this explodes into you know, uh, just massive amounts of growth in these and these. And this really is a mess. You know? And so, so now, not only do I have a, a, a gateway here that's trying to facilitate all these different pieces in a way that it really can't handle because they're deployed independently, but I've just got a, a mess of dependencies uh, in a way that's kind of hard to keep track of. And it's to address this, this mess of, of a service mesh that we have that we really want to move towards something like Kubernetes. Right? So what we want to do is containerize these services inside of Kubernetes, add something like Istio to that, and of course, working for Google, that's what I'm pitching. And then what we have the ability to do here with App is add an adapter in there that gets in the middle of it. So this same control plane that I'm using to manage and make that consuming audience tractable that's coming in from the outside at the edge, uh, I can use that same control plane to keep track of those same internal audiences that are consuming uh, between each other inside the mesh. And even that internal app, likewise, inside the internal parts of the corporate network. OK. so. When we think about the mesh, it uh, kind of grows from simple concepts. So I've got services that want to communicate with each other. In this case, HTTP, gRPC, maybe even actual TCP between them. Um, and then at some point, I think, you know, I'm really worried about the security of this. And if I were doing this on virtual machines or on bare metal, I'd probably make sure I was setting up proper um, security rotation schemes for the keys that I'm using. But in this case, I can defer all that automatically to something like the mesh control plane for me, in that case, Istio. So Istio can make sure that I've got bi-directional MTLS deployed there. Uh, I also want to kind of distribute logs and take so any, any traffic that runs through any piece of this mesh, I want to offload that somewhere for further processing. I want to be able to distribute policies between them, make sure I can report them, have control over the routing, and uh, maybe even local authentication and authorization on these services independently uh, of one another, right? But maybe centrally controlled. So, so all these types of things I can control, and I, I, mean, I use a mesh and like a mesh enforcement piece to make that work. But rather than putting that, that the code in, inside my own applications, I might use something like a proxy. And in this case, it's a sidecar. And all, all that sidecar means is I deploy the service I care about. As a, from a DevOps perspective, I write the code I care about, and I have a process to deploy it. And then automatically, the sidecar appears next to it, and it's connected to the rest of my mesh to kind of control how I'm mediating that traffic. So now I've got a sidecar proxy process that's going to do the retries and the connection timeouts and the blocking and the throttling if I need to, as well as collecting the logs for the success and the failures and offloading that to another system. Um, over time, my, um, with, with, the, with this, I might realize that I've got this powerful control plane that sits underneath it. So these proxies themselves don't need to have that logic for that configuration stored natively. Rather, they can defer to a collection of pieces that lie here at the bottom. So Istio is a mess. Istio comes with a whole bunch of extra pieces, but they're powerful pieces. So I've, I've got a service like Pilot that's going to allow me to do secure naming. So every service that I deploy automatically registers itself with Pilot so that I can find them. And it takes over kind of that DNS lookup piece. If I don't want to use DNS and I want to use a more classic look up a service by its name and version and have it route it for me, I can defer that to Pilot and it'll do that. If I don't want to worry about the MTLS uh, certificates and I want them to roll, it's the Citadel process that takes care of that for me. And for Apigee's perspective, if I want something that's going to allow me to add extra functionality at that sidecar piece, and in our case, uh, to handle kind of uh, ingress gateway pieces and ultimately egress gateway pieces, I can use the mixer to add that kind of logic there. And we embed ourselves as, as Apigee directly into that mixer so that we can get that control plane back again. So everything's controlled from a central point, but I have a way, an attractable way, for posterity to control this growing suite of services that I deploy in that mesh and also to kind of keep track of them over time. OK, so services and APIs both need API management. And uh, so basically, you're going to have some kind of containerization system probably that lies underneath it, an orchestration framework. Upon that, you're going to have some kind of services management. Thousands of services, as it says here, I mean, your, your size and your mileage may vary in terms of how 
successful or unsuccessful you may be. I kind of think having thousands of certain autonomous services running in an environment might be a recipe for disaster. But you need some way to orchestrate those. And on top of that, you want an API management platform that forms the basis for you to productize these services so that the consumers, the customers of your APIs can find them no matter where they are. So that if they're inside the mesh, they can find them and use them. So if they're outside in the external world, they can subscribe to them. And if you want to, so that you can charge them money and make some money off of that. And that's it. How did I do on time? You okay? You did great. All right, yeah, good. thank you. Thank you. <laughs>